Hello, Bill. Hello, Sandy. I'm sorry, did you just get out of a 1980s music video? Look at that hair. <laughs> Come on, fluff it up a bit. Do it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> what can I say? It's been Is it a, a white snake day. in town? <laughs> it's been a blustery day, Bill. I have okay. been on four ferry trips today. You can see behind me, I'm not my usual location. Yep. Yeah, I like this location though. It looks good. I, I myself traveled by car and commuter train and subway to get home today this morning. So. And elevator or just the stairs to get to the roof? Oh, just the stairs. We have no elevator. We are not fancy like that. I see. So I'm on the Isle of Butte visiting my dad and his lovely partner, Laura. And they okay. very kindly let me record this evening. Uh, from their bedroom because <laughs> it's quiet um, and has a good view yeah you can see the sea behind me mm. yeah have you taken pictures out that window lately yeah there's a okay. few things on instagram from here from across my life <laughs> but um I do like this window the windows in the living room as well very similar view. Now this this <laughs> isn't the house you grew up in in any way is it no no okay that would have a whole different connotation, I think, hmm. being there. Uh, all right, so what are we talking about today? Okay, so last week we talked about in miniature, and at the time- Very, very small. We should talk about, as well, this idea of something that is expanded and becomes, you know, kind of, well, big, huge. So this week it's the world at large. Okay. Um, a conversation with Bill Wadman, that's you. That's me. Um, hi. Hi. I have two things for us because I think last week we managed to keep it to 35 minutes or something and that was much better. Okay, well let's keep it short. Okay, so um, I do have lots of things to say about larger scale works of art and the quality of that in terms of being a visitor or an experiencer of, of very large artwork. We've talked before yep. about Donald Judd, for example, um, and how that felt for me when I first experienced that in the flesh, so to speak, uh, and how different that was from seeing it small as a photograph. And I think that could be translated many times over. There are so many examples uh, from throughout art history where works that are vast are extraordinarily commanding because of their size. Um, and even things that don't necessarily have maybe a sense of technical skill as long as they're big we might think that they are extraordinary or amazing in some way yeah i i always my go-to whenever this comes up is usually uh uh richard Serra, right you know mm. like these large scale scale steel spirals and things that you can walk inside <laughs> and around and whatever um yeah okay i'm with you there Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at is Oliver Ellison from the Weather Project in 2003. Yep. You know this, um, having consumed it only through photographic images. Um, I did see it. Uh, actually, I was, you know, I was there. I went to see it at Tate Modern. Did it feel like, did it actually feel like this, where the, the ball of the sun felt like the whole room was hot because of it? It didn't feel hot. Yeah. But I was utterly mesmerized in it. I would have stayed there for a really long time. I did stay there for a long time. I mean, Actually, I think that's you down on the ground with your <laughs> like spread eagle down there. And it might be. Yeah. Um, it encapsulated something that was really magical and I think perhaps that's to do with the sheer scale of the, the work the installation it was commissioned by Tate um, or Tate Modern the Turbine Hall for those people who've never been to Tate Modern is a huge cavernous space yes um, that used to hold turbines <laughs> yes uh, this is a really interesting piece of work because it really is just a giant reflection um, but the thing that's also incredible about it is how light operates within this vast space. 
Um, yeah. And I, I wonder about that. You know, I wonder for you as a photographer working in smaller and more controlled spaces, you know, the operation yeah. of light is everything for you. Yes. Um, uh, so, somebody asked me last night, my friend Angus asked me last night, whether when I'm making a photograph, if I think about the composition first or the light first. Mm, well, what did you say? Composition. So I can always make light. Plus, I'm a shoddy photographer, so I have to do the hard part first. Anyway, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. I, I want to just go back to what you've said there. Yeah. Forget about Elias for a second. Yeah. You're a shoddy photographer, so you have to do the hard part first. Yeah. What does that mean? I think, uh, well, the first part, the word shoddy in American English means <laughs> not very good. Yeah, no, I know um, that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what I mean by that is, uh, jokes aside, what I mean by that is that um, I, I generally look through my viewfinder and see what I see in front of me and think, oh, that's very ordinary. How do I make it less ordinary? Um, that looks like I just held up a camera and I didn't add anything to it. Um, so I tend to worry having good light in an otherwise uninteresting composition is not going to save the composition, but adding good light to what is already a good composition can make a good composition, a great composition. So to me, step one is uh, composition because I can always make light. Well, not always, but most of the time I can make light. Yeah. I think I'm maybe the opposite way around to you. Well, do you, do you, t when you photograph though, you're tending to use available light almost all of the time. Yeah. Right. Where most of the time I'm seriously taking a portrait, I have light with me. Yeah. I mean, composition to me is obviously vital. Uh, but what I would say, the thing I notice, the thing that makes me want to make the photograph is usually the way that light is working within the space. Yeah, and for me, it's it's how the space is constructed geometrically. Mm. Well, the geometry of the space is really important. But it's the light that makes the geometry stand out to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's coming to the same goal, just from two different sides. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like, I, go ahead. I don't know. I would love to know, coming back to this, you know, how, I mean, there's lots of well-documented stuff about Elias and anybody who's interested in this should go and look at his own website, but also there's lots of stuff on Tate Modern website. You can read all about it, about the weather project, the idea that, especially in the UK, uh, kind of pretty standard greeting is hello, Oh, isn't the weather dreadful? You know, in Scotland, like today, even sure. the, the ferry. Um, you know, God, isn't it really drizzly today and horrible? You know, people talk about the weather in this kind of like a kinship, something that unites them in a common experience yeah. ahead of other. Yeah, we're, we're we're all we're all dealing with this together, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, but the reason why, it, obviously, I put it on this particular presentation, thinking about scale is the overwhelming sense that we exist as something bigger, um, actually. It, it is what we're saying. We exist as something bigger that somehow connects us um, and that we can experience it together. We might not experience it to the same depth or from exactly the same position, for example, and that could be both positioned geographically, physically, it could be positioned intellectually or emotionally. Um, those things are separate. I'm not, I'm not sure if they are. Um, yeah. But as I said, when I experienced this work, it was spellbinding and yeah. very moving. And what I find interesting about that is I am highly privileged in that I come from a most extraordinarily beautiful place and I have seen the sunset. And where I live in Bournemouth, actually, on the south coast of England, you know, it's also very beautiful in its own way it has its own pretty darn nice yeah yeah you know to watch the sun rise and to watch the sunset is a very beautiful peaceful thing i'm yeah. not sure why it should be so 
extraordinarily moving in the turbine hall at Tate Modern. Um, and the I only think, I think I it's I think it's primordial to some extent, right? I mean, yeah, it's it's, it's life giving. I also, you know, it's interesting. You use the word uh, expand earlier, and I always feel like a star, especially something like this, where it's like, oh, the sun in front of you. I'd imagine almost like it would feel like it was slowly just getting a little bit bigger all the time. If I was sitting there watching it. There's also an element of control in terms of the conditions of this so-called weather experiment or weather project. You know, there's a very, very fine mist in the space. And yeah, to make it a little volumetric, yeah. And the what we may think of as the the sun or this huge circle. Well, a date even <laughs> above us. Yeah. It's actually a big semicircle. And it's made of uh, monofrequency lamps. So the kind of things you'd find in street lights. Yep. Yeah, so everything is reduced to this duotone. Well, I mean, it, I think it's actually written down as a duotone landscape. That's how it's described. Um, and what that means is the register of light really reads as yellow and black. Yeah, you, 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 you don't have any of the spikes in the spectrum to actually reflect any other colors. But what's really interesting about that is in, in the being there, I don't know if you find this, it's almost like being in a romantic movie. The light is like being in a romantic movie, not actually at sunset or sunrise, which would of course in itself have connotations of romance. Sure. But it's that kind of city street light romance it's perhaps even a bit somehow grittier where you turn to the person next to you and they look transportingly beautiful yeah and part of it part of it is i think because you can't quite see them 100 percent clearly so imagination plays <laughs> a role and you know i mean like almost you know they use you know red lights in concerts on people Especially as they get older, they use warmer lights because everyone looks good in red light, like on a stage, like a spotlight. Yeah, I mean, I, I know myself in the dark room at school with the red light on. Catch yeah. in the mirror in there, I think. You're like, I look pretty cool in this red light. Wow, you know. I'm You're like, I'm gonna go get some, I'm gonna go buy a red light bulb right now. <laughs> yes. Just wander around with it above my head. Yeah, on a little stick with a line. <laughs> but anyway, Bill, I don't know if you can use your imagination now to imagine yeah. being in this space, being with this work, feeling that the entirety and the sort of the massiveness, the massive scale of it. You know, how, yeah. do, how do you think you would react? Well, I listen, I also think that there's another layer before I answer your question, which is that this space even empty, sorry, helicopter going overhead. Um, those are people, rich people going from Manhattan to JFK to get on an airplane. Um, I don't know. I'll go with them. They're going to London, meet you in London. Um, they- uh, Turbine Hall, let's go and see what- Yeah, you know, I'll meet you at Turbine Hall, <laughs> something's there. Um, that, that space, has a massiveness all to itself, right? Massive is the wrong word because that's, I mean, it's the right word, but not the correct word. Um, there's this this uh, expansiveness just to the space. So then you have this piece of artwork, which is also at a large scale in that space. And it's like doubly so, you know what I mean? Like even if you went there and there's nothing going on, they're setting something else up, that is still a space where you walk in and kind of go, whoa. Yeah. Um, so I think it's doubly so because of, of all of this. It was very interesting on the, like from here, a different view, you can see the, the platform, you know, mm -hmm. you, could, you could lie on the, on what I think of as like the basement level, which is sloping, or you could go up onto the, the first kind of mezzanine layer, which is here. And um, how to describe this adequately, you know, it was almost like there was a proletariat level and then there was a primitive level. 
and to be not on this one but the one below which is from the the first image lying on the ground yeah, wait do you have to do you have to pay the bottom hall is public right yeah the, you do you have to walk, pay to get to the mezzanine you walk into these no you just walk into okay. these places all right yeah, I, I i forget exactly the setup yeah can i just say how amazing it is in this country that you can access art for free and you can choose to make donations or someone like me, you can choose to be a member of these institutions. And yes, it might be because it means you get to go into the nice members lounge for your lunch. But you know how lucky we are, we just, I can just wander on in there. I, I went to the Met this weekend with my little sister. I was just walking around and I, we paid, uh, you know, I, we can get in because we're New York residents, we can get in for free, but I paid $10 a piece for us to go in and, you know, just walking around with Sophie. It was like, yeah, it's, 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 it's one of the things, the reasons why I couldn't not live in a big city, I think, especially like a major city, like, you know, New York or London or something, you know, DC, you go to the National Gallery, it's all free, you know, yeah. the Smithsonian, all free. That, you know, I've been here quite a few days now, come to see my family. Yeah. Um, in the most extraordinary, beautiful landscape. Yeah. And I feel so nourished by it. Yeah. And soothed by it and awed by it. And I'm from here. You know, it doesn't stop being extraordinary ever. Yeah. And just off the back of saying, you know, you wouldn't live outside the city, for example. And I yeah. <laughs> never say, well, you're wrong to think that because I can understand that. that. Well, I did for my early life. I lived out outside of the city. Yeah. Whereas I didn't. I was just there. I was just there for two days uh, next to, you know, kayaking in a lake. Well, I mean, I was a city brat. Yeah. Yet this has always been my ancestral home. Well, yeah. 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 But the the scale of it, you know, Scotland's a very small country. Yet when you're here and you're on the water or you're up a mountain or you're looking across the sea, you know, you actually disappear. This is not a bad thing. No, it kind of goes on forever in all the directions. And because of the mountains and hills and uh water and islands it all kind of feels like it kind of goes on forever i'd imagine mm. i'm thinking about this a lot though at the moment this idea that you know in in looking you know is is in is looking always about an image seeing an image or is is attention the looking and in so doing do we actually i don't mean negate ourselves because that then has a negative connotation I mean, simply does one, um, you know, does one stop one's own, I don't know, e whatever it is, ego. I have become the thing I am looking at and more giving attention to. And there's a collapse of separation. There is no separation. Uh, and that is something very profound. I'm not making much sense of it, but. Wait, you're saying that you don't feel separation from your environment when you're up there? No. Interesting. I mean, I, I don't feel indifferent, but I it makes me uncomfortable. It's interesting. Did you, uh, do you find the other things that have been in this turbine hall as fascinating as this one? Usually they're they're pretty extraordinary. I have to say, I mean, the commissions are wonderful. The way way stuff with the the seeds, every single one handcrafted. All right. I mean, that yeah. was just so humbling. Uh, the Rachel White Reed with the cities of white boxes. 
also yeah, I remember humbling. the white boxes. This is humbling. You know, what I'm looking at now, I know I'm, it's a poor approximation when we have to look at it via photographs, when the photograph is just the record. To have been here in this space uh, with this event, I would go as far as to say this phenomenon. You know, I mean, Elias and what did I write down? There's a really lovely quote, which I probably can't find now. But there's a sense, you know, that he's he's dealing with this kind of um, elemental nature, like weather is the closest thing many of us experience to true nature. Yeah. Isn't it? So even if we're not in a, what we would think of as a natural environment, the weather still has some kind of an impact on us. Yep. Um, and maybe there bring, that brings up a sense of sadness in, in this, like almost like an apocalyptic <laughs> sense in this work well i think i think that we all sort of forget about we all forget about the natural world nowadays until the natural world comes and kicks us in the butt do we you know do we forget yeah i think i think a lot of people do i think you take for granted the fact that weather is happening around you and the sun goes up and the sun goes down and yeah i'm sure i forget about the natural world bill I do. I'm staring at beautiful clouds right now. It looks like a Simpsons episode. Um, but but I but I it's it's you know I don't think about the sun all the time. I, I could see Sandy judging me from six thousand miles away. No, it's it's an interesting thing because um, how does one not think about the sun? Well, I just, I guess what I mean is that it's so <laughs> elemental no, that you- I'm really stupid now because I, so I have no clue half the time. I must sound like such an idiot. You know- How do you mean? Well, just, well, I don't know. I think, I, think we, I think we take it for granted, all of it, you know? And I think when you have something that both isolates and uh, uh, amplifies the reality of something like a star in a space kind of thing like this with the light and the immediacy of it. I think that, I think that there is something, I think it all takes center, center focus. Do you know, I mean, you didn't grow up in a city, whereas as I described myself as a city brat, but every summer I was sent out into the countryside, whether it was to go to my uh, grandparents, other home that was on the east coast in North Berwick or whether it was to go up to my other grandmother who lived uh, or stayed in her sort of second home up in Melanoutrigal which is in Wester Ross or whether my mum was putting me on a bus in Glasgow which by the way you know I think about my child would I ever do this with my child now probably not but I mean I was put on a bus in Glasgow just stick her on a bus and send her across the country uh -huh, basically at, you know 12 with, with with directions pinned to her back no mobile phone you would be sent up we'd get off the bus I would go with a friend or a group of friends and we would go to Rasse which is a tiny island off off sky again yeah. two ferries worth uh, get off the bus at Fort William and have a bag of chips, get back on the bus, maybe make a call from a telephone box to say to mum, you know, I'm still alive. And then, you know, you'd be quite literally ferried off to some outer Western Isle <laughs> yeah. uh, for quite a long period of time. And, you know, lying as, lying as, a, as a girl, um, Again, it just sounds maybe really naff now, but beneath a canopy of stars and okay, sure. looking at the sky and, and understanding uh, something vast, something really vast. Yeah. Do you think that, do you think that um, some people lose touch with the concept of big, you know? Like, you know, I, it, when, when, I mean, as, as vast and empty as where you are now, you know, if, if, you know, we were all in a car and went out to Western Montana or, you know, the middle of nowhere in Utah, where there's nothing for 50 miles in every direction, mm. just desert, you know, 
um, or even worse, I, or even crazier, you know, you go to Australia into the middle of Australia and there's nothing for, there's literally no people for a hundred miles you know, in any direction. Um, it's almost like our, our psyches are not prepared for that kind of isolation in a lot of ways, especially if you're used to a lot of people around. But I find that I have a, an increasing um, appreciation. Uh, it's not an aversion, but oh. like lots of people where I choose to live, for example, I, I don't want there to be lots of people. I mean, I grew up in an apartment block with lots of yep. people. Um, I'm going to be moving soon because my circumstances yeah. have changed and where I move to I'm probably going to have to accept that I will need to move back into some kind of apartment and the thought of that makes me feel a bit agitated interesting um, I, I it's yeah I mean we've talked about it before but you know when I am I when I am away from everyone the demons take over <laughs> in my brain. It goes bad quickly. It's interesting. I guess maybe it's an introvert extrovert thing. Where are you compartmentalizing yourself as now, Bill? In this particular example, an extrovert. And so you're compartmentalizing me as the introvert? Well, I think someone who would rather be in an out in the middle of nowhere, away from other people, that is a, is a decent uh, description of one. You make your own fun. I need other people to make my fun, I think. Mm -hmm. There's a running thread through all our talks, you know, I've noticed this. Which is what? Which is where you fit us into the boxes and I react to that compartmentalization. Yeah. Did you take um, us out of the boxes? No, I don't at all. I actually probably push us further into them. Uh, but there's also a sense that you talk about fun and then I go about denouncing fun in some way. <laughs> in this case, I, 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 I was kind of making the opposite point, but okay. No, yeah. it's, it's just so strange sometimes what comes up when we talk about things that are seemingly disconnected. Well, that's, you know, that's a, that's a good uh, online therapy session for you. <laughs> yeah. What's... I, well, okay, so there was a very excellent link in my mind when I put this together, of course. Um, and I have said before that I would love to talk with you about Barnett Newman. I don't think we're going to manage to do him justice with one image, Cathedra from 1951. Where is this? Do you know? It's in Amsterdam. Okay. Uh, and this is very big painting. I mean, it's 2.5 tall, uh, nine, maybe, I wrote it down, I'll tell you exactly. Five meters wide. Um, You will have seen Barnett Newman paintings in the flesh. Yeah. Yeah, so have I. And I especially, I think, again, it was Tate Modern, actually. There was an excellent retrospective a few years ago, and I went. Um, and like Donald Judd, the experience of actually seeing and being with these paintings was actually very different to having seen them as reproductions in a book or online. Uh, but actually, I had always realized that I found his work very beautiful, very moving. Because of the simplicity? Well, I'm going to just put it to this. I know this isn't the full painting. Um, I think the reason why it's always had such an impact on me is because it's because of the zip and because of the sense that in this huge painted scene, this scape, uh, one could be fully immersed into into a space yet there was also a push and a pull and uh obviously separation from the zip either side the zip itself being somehow representative of something that is about entering uh, a void 
or going to the point of the horizon. And actually that was maybe a tenuous link between the Eliasson stuff and this, is that for the weather project, the semicircle of light, you know, comes out on a horizontal space and becomes a reflection. And of course you lie there and you can see yourself on the ceiling as well. With this, there's an element of reflection, self-reflection, uh, this kind of much more emotional, um, very deep spiritual sense of reflection. But there's also an immersion into the surface of the paint and through that, it becoming a portal and the zip actually becoming like a horizon, though it's on a vertical axis, there's a sense that you would enter the space and that it can be actually very uh, rejecting for some people. But for me, I find it extraordinarily welcoming and very- Wait, do you, 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 you imagine the zip being a, 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 a slot you could pass through? Yeah, and I think that ties into early work as an artist for me as well. You know, I was very influenced by this work um, and the idea that, uh, you know, I've, we've talked about it before, but maybe not on camera. The idea that in line spaces, one enters, you know, there's a, there's a sliver of space through which we enter the sublime. Mm -hmm. And further to that, a sense that in approaching a horizon, which is the impossible task, there is magic and power. And uh, okay, I don't know enough about this work to say whether or not this is total bunk. Not your what you're about to say, what I'm about to say. But it, I, I also see it as an artist saying, all right, I'm going to give you this giant 15 foot wide expanse for you to get lost in this blue. Yeah. But I'm going to ground you by creating this very obvious sort of fault in it wow. that, that snaps you back into reality. So it's interesting that you see that hole as an expanse into something unknown. I see that sh uh, the zip as the thing that snaps me back to reality. But that snap back to reality, Bill, when we really look at that and pay attention to it, to have the zip there and for it, rather than being an entry point, for it to be a line of reality. I'm not, again, I say this phrase a lot on these things, I'm not trying to be too obscure, but maybe they're the same thing. We ascribe different language to it. We're, we're actually experiencing the same thing. Your reaction to it is a jolt backwards, whereas my reaction is no different. It's still, a, if not a jolt, it, there's no violence in it at all, for example. But there's, there's still a sense that the zip is, mean, let, let's just say the zip is meaningful. The slice of space is meaningful somehow. Mm -hmm. and, and in that meaning, and in this very large scale, when we enter the space, we have a profound sense of something that is more than we perceive ourselves to be. Because actually our perception is being played with here because the painting is so big that we, we can enter it. We are subsumed into the surface of the painting. And, you know, we could talk about actually even representational painting, even mannerist style paintings, where we might be absorbed into the surface of the painting or become part of an action. Yeah. You know, if you think about Delacroix or Jericho or any of these big paintings that hang in the Louvre. Yep. Um, the Raft of the Medusa, huge painting. You know, we yep. enter the space of suffering and also actually of redemption with the survivors. Uh, of rescue, of savior. But it would be totally different if it was three feet wide. It would be. Okay. I mean, that's, that's you, why we're talking who, about it. I mean, who's who's the guy, who's the, uh, the sculptor who makes the large scale, like human heads that are, you know, Ron it's like 10, yeah, where it's just like a head laying on its side in the middle of a room. Yeah, Ron And Mook. it's really freakishly, whatever. Yeah. Um, 
How do you feel about those? Do those freak you out? Um, I, I think they're very clever because um, to play, to, to mess with me on that level is very smart because um, it might force a sense of my own size. It might make me feel diminished or greater. Again, I come back to what you said now, two episodes in a row about the, the Disney World phenomena of five eights to give control. A loss yep. of control one might feel when something is larger. Again, I'm sorry if I've mentioned this before, but I do think it's something quite interesting. For many years, I went to visit a friend in Ireland um, every summer before I had Imogen. And she and her husband were both very tall and I'm very small and I'm... Um, Come on, come on, you're a wee woman. Their, uh, their kitchen had been designed, a bespoke kitchen, and everything was slightly raised to suit yeah. them. Yeah, and so they didn't have to bend down as far to reach into the sink or whatever, yeah. And so when I went to stay with them for a week every summer, I felt like a child. Now, that to me is actually a most wonderful feeling. Uh, but I know other people would be very disconcerted by that because there's a sense- you, you felt it as a gift. Do you think that that, I mean, I don't, we don't need to get too deep in this because we could go down a giant rabbit hole with what I'm about to say. But do you think that is partly because you enjoyed being a smaller child in some way? Where that really makes me uncomfortable because I did not at all like being a smaller child? I think I enjoy the sensation of being maybe like a, maybe, maybe it's not a child. Maybe it's another, oh, I see. maybe it's something else. Sure. Which I dare uh, not say on YouTube in case <laughs> yeah. people think I'm totally crazy. <laughs> Um, by the way, I love the fact that we're seeing the sea get darker behind you. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's getting dark behind me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that, um, can I just point out how well we match this painting right now? Oh, do we? Yeah. Oh, because I have the blue and <laughs> you have the blue. Yeah. You have the white around your piping on your chair and I have my white, the shutters. White, white headphones, white headphones. You're, I, I think if, you're, if your uh, white balance came down about 500 degrees, it would really, it would really pop. <laughs> anyway, Bill, do you enjoy being absorbed into the surface of artwork? Um, when I'm in the right mindset, sometimes it makes me feel uncomfortable. Why does it make you feel uncomfortable? I don't like, I don't like art dominating me. I want to dominate artwork. <laughs> There's the quote of the day. There's the Wadman nugget. <laughs> well, I think this is just so, it, it's sublime to me. I find it. I mean, very plus easy. you get lots. You get all the. You know. Can you go to the last slide just real quickly? Just to. I want to see the full version. Yeah. Okay. So he's also doing a golden ratio thing here too. Yeah. I mean, in uh, I think ninety seven, it was attacked, and it ha was slashed five times on horizontal slashes. Somebody went. I feel like I know this, and and then they have to put it back together again. And they had to stitch it and actually yes that that in itself you know of course gives a whole other layer of meaning to this painting which in its own right is already very meaningful i mean barnett newman you know go and find out about and people watching if you don't know about barnett newman fascinating i think fascinating character he was so um i don't know if wise is the right word you know he just seemed to be 
in tune with something greater. Sure. Or again, language is very misleading here. He was in no way better than anybody else, but at the same time, to me, he seems profound. There's a there's a documentary about them repairing this or something that I saw. Mm. Am I wrong in that, or do you, does that make, ring a bell? There, there might be. I haven't seen it, but you know the the slashes and the the restitch of the the canvas yeah. has made this all the more kind of. Special. It's like what you were saying. You know, the, why was why is the Mona, Mona Lisa, Lisa stolen? Right. Yeah. yeah. So she got stolen. There she is. She pops up again. Hey, presto! Most famous painting in the whole wide world. Um, I mean, and if you go to the Louvre, for example, the biggest painting in the Louvre is uh, the wedding feast at Cana, which is the the biblical story of Christ turning water into wine. And it's it's kind of like a it's vast. I mean, it's like nine meters wide or something. Um, and it's so big that when it's crowded, you might as well just feel like they're an extension of your own crowd visiting. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, but there's something about that, you know, and, and there's something maybe transferable and transmutable about that sense of communality with artwork. Yeah. I find I find things that are photorealistic -y, like the the large Chuck Close faces that are, you know, yeah, four by five meters, you know, these like big giant things. Yeah. Those make me uncomfortable in a lot of ways in the same way as those big heads that we were talking about. It's interesting. We're gonna have to dig deeper into this. Well, you've not said very much this evening. Sorry. You're not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have to go. Okay. Anyway, the takeaway from this, what's the takeaway from this, Bill, before we do finish? Um, bigger is better, always. <laughs> That's why I bought a 102 megapixel camera so I can make giant prints that people will like. That's why I feel feel so self-conscious being so small. Thank you, Sandy. Bye, Belle. Bye.